Hey everyone, in this video we're gonna be talking about, guess what, a Japanese RPG again. I play a lot of those. And this time it's Knights of Azure. It's a hack and slash action RPG for the PS4 and for the PS Vita in Japan. This is a game that sports an absolutely wonderful box art. I really like the way the art's blue tones match the PS4's otherwise rather jarring blue signature color. It really is representative of the game's gorgeous art style. I feel that it would have been however better if the main character's red dress popped out a little bit more. Other than that I have no complaints about the composition or title placement or anything really, it's just perfect the way it is. The disc itself is also very beautiful. It uses the image that I believe the Japanese box art uses. So right off the bat we see that we are dealing with a game that has very capable artists behind it. However, art alone isn't enough to make a good game, and let's just see what kind of a game Knights of Azure actually is. As I always say, story is very important in a Japanese RPG for me. Knights of Azure has a lot of story to it, but just how good that story is, is another question. The basic premise of the game is rather interesting. After a demon, or the Night Lord as they call him, was defeated, the world baited in his blue blood which rained from the skies. Anyone and anything this blue blood touched turned into a demon or a fiend, even inanimate objects. And this alone makes for an absolutely outstanding premise which could have been developed in a very, very interesting way. Unfortunately, the game takes a more generic approach to all this, and we once again have a story about, about a girl who has to sacrifice herself in order to keep this demon from being resurrected and bestowing eternal night on the world. So that there is rather disappointing considering how interesting the premise is, especially with inanimate objects coming to life. From there on out, this develops into a rather tender story about two women, one of whom happens to be the sacrifice, the other one a knight protecting the sacrifice, and their journey to see the sacrifice's mission to the very end. Of course, the knight, the main character we play as our niece, would rather protect her friend and even romantic interest than have her sacrifice herself. So, torn between her mission and her love for the sacrifice girl, the main character, our niece, tries to find an alternative way to defeat this Night Lord or prevent him from resurrecting, therefore saving her friend's life. It's a very tender and gentle story with a lot of emotion in it. However, the writing is a mixed bag. The two main characters and their relationship is very well presented. It's very tender, it's very beautiful. <laughs> But the same cannot be said about the side characters, or story in general. We are looking at a rather underwhelming and not very memorable cast of characters who are there to just be comic relief, however the humor isn't all that good, so a lot is being said, but very little of it has meaning. The writing for the two main characters is very well done, however, side characters, honestly, I don't even remember the things they talked about. Characters are developed through random events during the dungeons or in the hub world, the hub level or the lobby. These events should technically make the characters grow as people and help the player relate to them, however outside of Lily's, the other characters honestly don't really develop much and what little development they have is soon and very quickly forgotten. During some of these events I found myself skipping through the text just to make the event end sooner because very little was being said and I honestly did not care about the things that the game kept going on and on about.
Another issue I have with Knights of Azure is the lack of good world presentation. Gameplay takes place during nighttime, because that's when all the fiends demons come out. And daytime is reserved for some side activities Arnis does that help increase her attributes. I'm glad that we don't have to play some weird mini games in order to increase these attributes, because I absolutely hate mini games. However, it would have been great if we could explore the world during daytime. It would have been awesome to just first-hand experience the world, the town during the day, meet these NPCs we read about, and just help the player relate to this world a little bit more. Unfortunately, Knights of Azure does not do that, and in my opinion, that really serves to hinder the overall experience. So, while well, definitely engaging enough for me to see it through to the end, the story never quite realized that full potential it had with its premise, unfortunately. But, hey, it was still a fun little generic anime story that I enjoyed. Now, in terms of gameplay, Knights of Azure doesn't really break any new ground, and it shouldn't. It's a fun little hack and slash RPG with very basic, simple gameplay mechanics. You hack and slash your way through waves of enemies with different weapons you acquired throughout the game and have your demon bodies help you in combat. You collect demons as you play or purchase them from certain vendors that sell them, and during combat they level up, they gain experience, their appearance changes as they grow stronger, and as long as you have them equipped on one of your monster decks that you can switch out on the fly in combat as needed, they will still earn experience and level up even if they don't directly participate in combat which is a good thing in my opinion. You can collect different types of monsters, there's tanks, and melee attackers, ranged attackers, there's magic users, healers, monsters that buff some of your stats, and so forth. All that is pretty much, you know, your usual RPG fare, especially when it comes to monster battling and monster mechanics in games. There's nothing really special there. However, the combination of monsters you have equipped on an active deck affects your main character's transformation ability. Now what this is, is basically the more you fight, the more a certain gauge fills up. And once this gauge is full, you have the ability to transform into some sort of a demon form. There are several different forms you can transform into, and they all pretty much give you the ability to dish out more powerful attacks for a limited time. And then you have to fill up the gauge once again and rinse and repeat as you fight. <laughs> And you do your fighting with the various weapons you acquire throughout the game. Now, there aren't that many weapons, and I'd normally tell you that you need to master using these weapons and the combos they come with and the different attacks you have in order to properly advance through the game and through the dungeons, but in Knights of Azure's case, mastering the weapons and combos and different attacks you have isn't all that important for the most part. However, that doesn't mean that the five different weapons you acquire throughout the game don't all feel different. For example, the mace deals heavy damage and is slower. The daggers are fast, but deal lighter damage. Your ranged weapon barely deals any damage, however, it can be used to heal your demons. And the sword, which you probably will be using the most, is an all-round, well-balanced weapon. Then there's another sword you unlock later that feels slightly different from your default one. It has a longer range and it feels kind of heavier. Knights of Azure does have combo attacks. Some can be even triggered by switching weapons at just the right moment. And you have three default types of attack. You have a light attack, you have a heavy attack with each weapon, and a special attack, which drains your special gauge, whatever it's called, and that replenishes over time. So you should know when and how to utilize these attacks, but it's not essential for you to clear the majority of the game. You can overcome most challenges by simply button mashing and switching weapons at random and just dishing out whatever powerful attacks you have on you at a given time and equipping the items you feel are most suitable for a given situation on yourself or your demons. And that's all well and good, that's something I really loved about the game, until I had to get the true ending of Knights of Azure. You see, once you beat the game, you get a certain ending. There are three possible endings you can get, and I believe I got the best one, but it was still rather underwhelming. However, in order to get the true ending of the game, which in my opinion is well worth getting, it's a beautiful ending, you have to replay the final chapter of the game from your clear data and face some more challenging bosses. 
Now, at first, those bosses seem like real nightmares. You, you die in an instant even though you're perfectly leveled up and your monsters are strong. And the reason for that is because you don't have the right equipment on you. So once you farm out the items you need, once you equip yourself properly and understand the bosses and understand a little bit more about attacking and all that, you're going to easily defeat them. However, the game never eases the player in and it never teaches the player to mind their equipment and to really care about all these items you acquire throughout. So you're never really prepared for it, for something like this and those boss fights seem more difficult than they actually are because the game just throws something completely new at you expecting that you would know about it and you'd know how to deal with it. Now, the real challenge of the game comes in optional arena challenges that you can do if you want to. I personally did a few and realized they're rather tedious and didn't really have much motivation to keep doing them because they don't add anything to the story, I believe. Maybe they do, I wouldn't know. And a rather difficult optional dungeon you unlock after beating the game once. Now, this, this optional dungeon is way too much for me, but I'm sure that some more capable and hardcore players will find joy in exploring and clearing this dungeon, because this is where you need to understand your equipment better, you need to understand your use of weapons better, and the type of monsters you have on your active decks, and so forth. Knights of Azure has more optional content than just arena challenges in the dungeon. You have side quests that you can do. The game automatically generates side quests for you to earn money or blue blood. Now, this blue blood is basically your currency for leveling up, for purchasing certain monsters or items, and for bringing your monsters to life from the items or fetishes, as they're called, you acquire through combat. Actually, you earn most of your blue blood through combat, and later in the game you unlock a sword, as I said, which also has the ability to draw a hell of a lot more blood from monsters, so you're always going to have enough of this substance to do whatever you need. No, money you acquire through side quests and selling items you find during combat and you acquire a ton of money throughout the game that you never really get to use much. The only thing that I used my money on was another optional thing where one of the characters, the treasure hunter guy, has search parties he can send throughout the world to search for and acquire rare items and that's pretty much all I spent my money on for the most part. I eventually earned the maximum amount of gold, and I didn't know what to do with it. There is also another form of side quests which are not randomly generated, and they are the daily activities Arnis can do. Now, not all daily activities are in the form of side quests. There are some that you can just assign to Arnis, and she will do them automatically, just like she completes the daily side quests automatically, if you've spent enough time in the dungeon. So basically, once you spend enough time in the dungeon, you get a log of what Arnis was doing during the day, and it lists all her daily activities with a little bit of story here and there especially if she's done some side quests. Whether they're side quests or just regular daily activities you assign to her, they all earn you certain attribute points. And you can use these attribute points to unlock certain perks. Some of these perks increase your demon form timers, others increase your tech power. Then there are those who unlock different and more daily activities. Then we have a perk, for example, that increases the timer the dungeons have. And you don't have to worry about this timer too much, you're going to increase it before you know it, and even if you don't, there's plenty of time to do what you need to do in dungeons. And even if time does happen to run out, you'll just be returned to the lobby without losing your progress, so there's nothing to worry about there. Regardless of what perks you unlock, they all serve one purpose, and that is to make the game even easier than it already is. So, before you know it, you'll unlock them all and have a ton more attribute points to spend that you'll have nothing to spend on. So, gameplay-wise, Knights of Azure is a relaxing game. It's nothing special, but it's fun for what it is, and I'm glad the hardcore content is separated from the main game, because I honestly would have hated it if I had to go through all sorts of weird challenges just to see the story through to the end. And now it's time to talk about aesthetics, visuals, 
animation and all that stuff. For starters, I will say this, the artists behind Knights of Azure are exceptionally capable and talented people. The character designs in the game are outstanding, and visually, Knights of Azure has a certain elegance, certain beauty to it. However, I feel that the monsters you encounter collect and fight could have been a little bit more creative and diverse. A lot more could have been done with the monster designs because some of them are excellent and some of them are just dull. Another thing I have a problem with is the way the camera in the game is positioned so it doesn't really let you see the environments well and part of enjoying a world is seeing that world. This game really does everything it can to obstruct the world whether by not letting you see it during the day or by giving you a weird camera that doesn't really show you much of the world. So that's a huge downside in my opinion. However, one thing that really bothered me about the game is the walking animation of our niece, the main character, and her monsters. The speed your character moves at does not match the animation properly. So whether it's running or walking animation, that matter, she always feels like she's just sliding on the ground somehow. I kind of got used to it, but I never really completely got over it. And then you see some big heavy monster whose walking animation doesn't really reflect his weight or anything. It just he slides on the ground the same way our knees does and at pretty much the same speed. I don't know, it's just, it's very undercooked. It shouldn't have been done like this. And I mean, we have a team of professionals working on this game and obviously capable artists whose fantastic art style was very well translated into the game. So why they botched the animation like this is beyond me. It's just something that should not have been done because it kills immersion the way it is, at least for me. However, the music in Knights of Azure is fantastic. Sure, not all tracks are fantastic, but some of them are absolutely outstanding and they really manage to add to the game's atmosphere. I'm not a music person, so I can't talk about music all that much. I don't know what to say about it, but it felt good. It fit the game perfectly. It fit the art style, it fit the atmosphere, it fit the setting. So I'm very happy with the game's audio. So everybody, that's all I have to say about this game, more or less. It's a decent enough experience. I wouldn't go out of my way to recommend it to people. I mean, I personally played it over the course of several months and I'd played here and there and eventually clocked around 70 hours into the game and finished it with all the endings and all that stuff. It was a good experience, it was enjoyable, but it's nothing special. It's nothing that I tell somebody to go out of their way to purchase a physical copy of or to buy it at full price. If you can check it out, borrow it from a friend, rent it or whatever, or buy it during a sale on PSN, but because you might not enjoy it. I mean, it's a very simple, straightforward game, and I know that many gamers prefer more complex and challenging games. I personally do not, so for me, this was the perfect game. It was fun, it was relaxing, it was simple, it had a dumb little anime story that isn't all that memorable, and I'm sure I'll forget in a few months, but it was a fun experience overall. Thank you.